Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Last time we left off our verse by verse study through the book of Philippians in chapter 3, verse 13. We made it through chapter 3, verse 13. So get your Bible, open it up to Philippians chapter 3, so that you can follow along and read the Bible verse by verse right along with me. <clears throat> now we're going through the New Testament, this series, which is something that I have never done in 33 years of teaching God's Word, because I've always taught through the whole Bible, from Genesis through Revelation. And I've done that three times, almost four. All the archives are at the Scripture Verse by Verse website going back over 33 years. So you can go there and click and listen to whichever series, whichever book of the Bible, whichever chapter, whichever section you want to. The important thing is to study the Word of God. And the whole counsel of God is so very important, Genesis through Revelation. So check it out. Study God's Word from start to finish. If you haven't already done that, I recommend that you do that. Again, that is at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Okay, well, let's pray and get into God's Word today. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, I want to begin reading in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul says that I may know him talking about Christ, that was the heartfelt desire of the Apostle Paul, to know Jesus better. And as I said last time, that is the heartfelt desire of every true Christian. Everyone who's saved has this great, overwhelming desire to know Jesus better, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So, you know, if you know Jesus, and you live for Jesus, and you're enjoying fellowship with him, then you can also count on the fact that you're going to suffer for him. Because as I mentioned last time, it's a package deal. All who live Godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, the Bible says. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's not saying he's got to work, you know, very hard and do what he can. He's not sure what he's going to do, but somehow, some way he's got to pull it off in order to get to that resurrection of the dead. No, but faith in Jesus Christ will get you raised and raised and, and get you a brand new body, living on a brand new earth forever and ever, along with all the other saved people. It's faith in Jesus. <clears throat> but your faith has to persevere. So you have to persevere with Christ. Salvation. Salvation is guaranteed to those whose faith endures to the end. Unconditional. Eternal security is an unscriptural lie from Satan. It is being taught today. That's why people re repeat the sinner's prayer and they never even repent. Or maybe they walk with the Lord for a little while and they turn away, but they've been told that they're saved unconditionally. They prayed that sinner's prayer. They're good to go. Nothing, nothing matters anymore. As some say, you can even become an atheist. Doesn't matter. You're still saved. It's a horrible lie from hell. I'm eternally secure, but it's a conditional security, conditioned upon our faith in Jesus Christ, because that's what saves. So with that, we read 12. Not, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfected, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There was one thing that drove the Apostle Paul, and there's only one thing that should drive us supremely, and that is our walk with the Lord, doing what God wants us to do. And that's true for every Christian. You wonder what God's will is for you? Christians are always seeking for God's will. I know what God's will is for you. Put him first in every area of your life. And if you do that, the rest of his will for you will fall into place. But do that. That's God's will. I also happen to know that it's God's will for me to teach his word, verse by verse. And anything that gets in the way of that gets jettisoned out of my life in a hurry. Because that's my supreme purpose for being here. I know it is. I don't have any doubts. At least for now, and it has been for over 30 years. I don't expect that it will change. If it changes, well, then I guess I'll know. But I do know that we're all called to live for Jesus and go all out. And that's what he's talking about right here. Christians, if Christians are dwelling on the past... They need to stop it and start dwelling on the future, which includes standing before Jesus to give an account of their deeds after becoming a Christian. That's where their focus should be. Our focus should be on trying to be everything that Jesus wants us to be today so that we are ready for that day in the future. So just forget the past. Don't dwell on the past. What is done is done. The bad things you have done, they're done. You can't change it. Maybe you're reaping the consequences of that. You can't change it. It is what it is. Confess your sins. Move on. Get a fresh start with God. If you sin, repent, confess, get it wiped off your record and start fresh. If somebody has wronged you in the past and who has not been wronged, don't dwell on it. Leave it be. Pray for the person who did it. Carry on with your life. 15, let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. You know, if you don't get certain things, if you don't understand, I should say, certain things about the Bible, you don't understand certain things about God and Jesus. If you don't get certain things that more mature Christians perhaps do get, don't worry about it. Just keep walking with the Lord. He'll show you what he wants you to know. It'll eventually happen. God will eventually make truths clear to people if they have a heart for Christ and they stay close to him. Just be patient with others, be patient with yourself, be patient with God, and keep living for him. Verse 16. Nevertheless, as to that which we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Don't worry about what you don't know. Don't get all shook up about what you don't know. Focus on living by faith. Focus focus on living by the truth that you do know. And God will give you more truth in the process. Live up to the truth that you know. And God will give you more truth as you go along. A big part, and a a big part of, of growing in our knowledge of God includes living for God today, right where we are, living for him right where we are, living up to the truth that we know is truth, confessing when we fail. That plays a huge part in us growing in our knowledge of God even more. He's not going to give you more knowledge of him if you don't live up to the truth that you already know. 
If you disregard that, if you play fast and loose with it and you really don't care, you don't confess, then you're going to regress. You're not going to progress in your walk with the Lord. And that's a dangerous place to be in because you could regress out to the, all the way to the point where you lose your faith. <clears throat> 17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them who walk, even as ye have us for an example. So to be an effective spiritual leader, you have to live out the message that God teaches. You have to live it out. A Christian leader must live out the Bible. And part of living out the Bible is confessing when you fail and not pretending that you don't fail. I'm not talking about airing your dirty laundry in front of everybody. That's a modern evangelical technique that makes me sick. It's a false sense of humility. They're looking for, they're looking for praise for their humility. You don't need to air out your failures, your sins to everybody. Tell a close friend if you want to, if you want to have them pray for you. Otherwise, it's between you and God. I've heard far too many preachers, modern evangelicals over the years, you know, air out their dirty laundry and, and talk about their shortcomings and just almost be proud of it, of the fact that they're saying it. And then everybody just fawns over them, especially the women, but not a few men too. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Ah, oh, he's so genuine. And the, and the dirty dog just sits there and laps it up. I have to do that. Don't hide your sin. Confess your sin. And if it involves somebody else, confess it to them. But to be an effective spiritual leader, you have to live out the message that you teach. And the tip message has to be the word of God. So you have to be holy. You have to live the Bible. You have to confess. You have to honestly admit when you sin to God and confess it to him and get a fresh start. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be an effective Bible teacher. And you're not a, a spiritual leader. Live the word. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Those who say that the cross of Christ did not sufficiently pay for our sins in and of itself, good enough, sufficient, all sufficient. Those who would suggest anything differently are enemies of the cross. It's a black and white deal. Those who say that we must add our own good works to obtain the redemption that Jesus already paid for on the cross, are enemies of the cross of Christ. If you say that you have to add anything to what Jesus did on the cross, you are an enemy of the cross of Christ. Adding anything to what Jesus already accomplished on the cross, as far as it goes, as far as salvation is concerned, that makes you an enemy of the cross of Christ because he did everything that needed to be done. And to say anything different, to imply anything different, is to make yourself an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Christians who insist on being self-centered instead of Christ-centered and other-centered are also enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross needs to be front and center. Jesus needs to be front and center. Those who refuse to die to self and pick up their cross and carry it daily, but instead live for themselves, are living as enemies of the cross of Christ as well. We're talking about total dedication, which is what Jesus deserves. We're talking about exalting the cross and the finished work of Christ. We're talking about living for Jesus as a result of all the good that he accomplished for us on that cross. And to, and to fail to do any of those things, especially to fail to do it purposely 
and then not repent and not confess makes one an enemy of the cross of Christ. 19, whose end is destruction. Talking about people who are enemies of the cross of Christ in the sense of teaching something beyond what Jesus accomplished on the cross for salvation. Anybody who teaches that you have to obey any law to be saved, do any amount of good works to be saved, in addition to believing on Christ and believing that his death on the cross paid for our sins. Anybody who adds anything to the message of the cross is an enemy of, of the cross of Christ and it will not be well for them because look at what happens to these people in the end. Whose end is destruction? Whose God is their appetite? And whose glory is in their shame? Who mind earthly things? A faith that saves is a faith that changes how we live too. I don't want to hear about carnal Christians who live like the devil and yet expect to be in heaven after they die. That is a lie. If, if their appetites are their gods, if their desires, their lusts are their gods, if they're fulfilling their appetites, fulfilling their desires, fulfilling the desires of their own heart. If these things are the most important thing to them rather than pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ, then those things are their gods. And if that is the case, and if their mind is set on earthly things, then God Almighty says right here that their destiny is destruction. It's a wake-up call. We get a lot of them in the Bible, don't we? Written to Christians. Remember, keep in mind, this is not written to a non-Christian. This is written to, to Christians. If, you're, if your appetites and your desires and your lusts and your sins are your gods, if they're more important to you than Almighty God and pleasing Him, then you are doomed to destruction at this point. You stand condemned. Which is why Jesus said, don't fear those who can only destroy the body. Fear him who has the power to destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus warned about the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life. So if your mind is on earthly things instead of on Christ, that's strong evidence that you're on that wide road along with everybody else. who doesn't care about Jesus. You're on that wide road to hell. 20. For our citizenship, talking about Christians, is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. True Christians are citizens of heaven. I've got to tell you, I was talking to somebody about this just last night. Actually, we were watching the Super Bowl. And all the talk before the Super Bowl, all the halftime junk, so many of the commercials, just, I, I finally, I was exasperated and I, and I looked at somebody and I said, you know what, I am so far removed from this world and the things that the people of this world, the unsaved people of this world think are so important and so neat I am so far removed from that. And the older I get, the less at home I feel in this world. I'm telling you, from the moment I got saved, I started having a different outlook on this world. But it just keeps growing and growing and growing where I really do feel, as the Bible says we are, I feel like a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. And I'm not in any hurry to check out because I, I've been asking God to let me live to 90 so I, can, so I can keep preaching his word for many more years. 
But when that day comes, I'm not going to regret it. I'll be happy. Just get me out of here. Because I, if, if God lets me live that long, I, I suspect it's going to be a whole lot worse than what it is right now. But I just feel so out of place in this world. The entertainment that it, that it offers doesn't entertain me. The humor that it provides doesn't humor me. I find, I find the vast majority of it all disgusting and sinful, dishonoring to God. I feel like I've taken a shower in manure when I watch some of the stuff. Or if I'm watching a game and, and some of the commercials or you know, some of the promos for different specials or TV shows come on, I feel like I've, I feel, I feel like I've been showered in manure. I feel filthy. I hate this world. You see, you shouldn't hate this world, Mike. God said, Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. A faith that changes your destiny changes how you live. So I say, Christians, and the reason, a reason that's the case, one of the reasons is true Christians are citizens of heaven. And that's why if we are saved, then we live with eternity in mind. If I'm an American citizen living in Iran and war breaks out between Iran and America, I guarantee you that I'm pulling for the United States of America. I may be living in Iran, but I'm pulling for the United States of America to win. And Christians may be living on earth, but we are citizens of heaven. And that's why we pull for God, not for the devil. That's why we pull for God, not for this world when it sets itself up against God. If we're saved, we have a heart for God. And it's not a problem to, as Colossians chapter 3 says, Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Gladly. Gladly. It's just that it's kind of hard sometimes because you're inundated with so much trash in this world. That's why, that's why it's so important for us to study the Word of God every single day without fail. Verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our lowly body that it may be fashioned like his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is such, this is such great news. Our, pre, our present body, <clears throat> excuse me, our present body will be transformed into a glorious body like Jesus had after he was raised from the dead. So you died today when Jesus returns. Your body is going to be raised physically. You're going to once again be in that body that you are in right now. Only it's going to be fixed up. It's going to be new. It's going to be improved. Never sick, never tired, never an ache, never a pain. And never to die. We have much to look forward to as Christians because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Any Christian who isn't going full blast for the Lord Jesus Christ and doesn't care that they're not going full blast for the Lord Jesus Christ is not a real Christian. Or they're slipping away real quick and they've lost sight of what Jesus has done for them. And that, my friends, is a very slippery slope to hell. And if you find yourself a lot more lukewarm than what you were when you first got saved, you better put the brakes on because it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And you're putting your soul in danger if you ever lose your faith. Any Christian who's not on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, has lost sight of what Jesus has done for them, 
He paid for our sins. He saved us from hell. He's going to rebuild these bodies of ours and turn them into something that will enjoy forever and ever on the new earth, which he's also going to make. Man, if that doesn't move you to want to serve Jesus Christ and live for him, then I don't know. Then you better check to see if you're saved because I wouldn't bet on it. Verse 21 again. Who shall change our lowly body? It's talking about Jesus. That it may be fashioned like his glorious body. Isn't that good news? That's what I was just talking about. Our, our bodies are going to be just like that glorious body that Jesus was raised in. I can't help it. I got to keep talking about it. I keep thinking about it. It's great. And the ramifications of it, they're beyond our ability to grasp right now. According to the working by which he is able to, able even to subdue all things unto himself. Jesus is God, you know. Jesus is going to bring everything under his control. And uh, since he is 100% good, that means when he has control of everything, everything will be 100% good. And it also means that if you want to be a good Christian, then you need to let Jesus have control of you. Because if Jesus is controlling you, you will be good. Because that's all he does. I'll say this. We can't be bad when Jesus is allowed to control our thoughts, words, and actions. We can't be bad. Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If Jesus is in control of your life, you can't be bad, period. You can't. Impossible. Makes me sick when people scoff at the sufficiency of Scripture and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. When I tell people, look, if you're not getting along with someone, they need to walk in the spirit. They need to put Jesus first. And you need to put Jesus first. And you're going to get along. You may not see eye to eye on everything, but even the things that you disagree on, it's going to be a, a, a holy disagreement. You can get along. You can't help but get along. And I've had people, evangelicals, scoff at me. People who say they believe the Bible, oh, scoff at me. Well, no, you need psychology. <sighs> Just forget it. Let's read chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. This guy, I told you, I think last time, that Philippians is the most personal epistle I think that Paul wrote. He just, he just loved the Philippians and they loved him and they were all on fire for Jesus, and that's why they got along so well. They loved each other so much. So he says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crowned, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Paul did not twist anyone's arm to get them to live for Jesus. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't shame Jesus by doing something like that. And that is a shame. That's a terrible thing to do to Jesus when overbearing pastors try to manipulate Christians into doing what they want, want those people to do and calling it living for Jesus, legalistic type preachers. That's a, that's a dirty, rotten thing to do to Jesus. You teach them about Jesus. You teach them the word of God so that they fall in love with Jesus more and more. And then they're going to do what Jesus wants them to do out of love for him. That's the kind of thing that glorifies God. Paul didn't twist anyone's arm to get them to live for Jesus. He didn't come up with a list of holiness rules either. Oh, man, I'm out of time. <laughs> Study with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Click the donate button and perfectly give us the Lord may lead. 
And until next time, so long, everyone.